I want to thank uh, Julie, and I want to thank everybody else responsible for this conference. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity uh, to be a veterinarian in sheltering today and have all of these resources, all of these knowledge resources gathered together. This is a very exciting time. Uh, I was a shelter executive director in 1992, 1993. I was two years out of veterinary school, and resources like this did not exist. Uh, those of you who have been in sheltering uh, for that amount of time will recognize that things have improved dramatically. And I think the knowledge base that we have, uh, the consulting resources that we have, uh, and the direction of sheltering uh, is very exciting. So for the veterinary students who are here today, uh, things are looking very strong uh, for being able to uh, get the upper hand on some of these problems where we've been struggling in a lot of communities uh, without the proper toolkit. This is my son's note from uh, last fall. Came home on a Thursday night from a shift at my practice, and this was on the countertop, and my wife had left it for me. Uh, this was directed anonymously. He didn't know who was making his lunch. I was making his lunch, so it was aimed at me. Uh, I was making him uh, sandwiches, avoiding peanut butter and jelly, because I thought there was a peanut kid in his class. Those of you with children know that there are peanut kids. Uh, and if you have a peanut kid in your children's class, you can't have any peanut-related products or bad things happen. So I had been avoiding peanut butter and jelly. This was a disappointment to my son. <laughs> and so I was corrected with this note. Uh, so the message for you is I've made a sandwich for you. I've put together a lecture, and I think I know what you need to hear. But rather than write me a note, raise your hand if I'm not giving you what you need. If you want peanut butter and jelly, raise your hand. Or find a crayon, leave a note. We'll pick it up later. I'm hoping that by the end of this morning, uh, this presentation at least, you'll have a pretty good appreciation for the benefits, uh, a general overview of how to create uh, uh, standard operating procedures, how to use them and revise them, because they're not static documents. They need revision. They need to be uh, cared for and fed, as it were. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about errors, uh, adverse events, bad outcomes, uh, and some ways to counter that. What I do with students primarily is teach surgery in a very high volume shelter, 32,000 intake, uh, 22,000 of that cats, about 10,000 dogs, Philadelphia City Animal Control Facility. Uh, we're in there three days a week with students. We do a lot of surgery. Uh, we also do surgery in another facility, so process orientation uh, and having a different group of students every week uh, is a challenge. So standard operating procedures and avoiding bad outcomes through attention to detail is something that we try to live um, in our program. We're going to introduce the concept of situational awareness uh, just to give you a sense of who you should be looking for to be a team leader or a surgical coordinator in the OR uh, or to be managing complex uh, operational tasks so that there's somebody who's got a sense of the whole uh, process uh, who can be the team leader. And then, believe it or not, we're going to take a lesson from Formula One. So this is a string of benefits. Um, these should be familiar for those of you who use standard operating procedures in your shelters. By the way, how many of you have a book or an online or a computer-based standard operating procedure manual for tasks in your shelter. Got some hands going up. Okay, okay. The alternative to that will be on the next slide, but the benefits to using standard operating procedures are consistency, improved patient care, and process-based quality assurance. So the entire process has built into it uh, methods for checking quality. Improved efficiency. How many of you wish you could do more surgeries, more vaccines in your shelter. If you have standardized processes, it makes you more efficient than having random processes. It facilitates training and cross-training. How many shelters hire people because they're short-staffed? They hire the first person that can fog a mirror. They assign them to somebody who's already overworked, overburdened, not particularly inclined to train somebody. And they say, train this person to do X. And the training consists of, here's X. 
and that's their on-the-job training. Uh, turnover is often very high in shelters, so training is critical, particularly when animals' lives depend on how well you do really simple tasks. Cleaning a cage is really simple once you know how to clean a cage. Using the right products, the right materials, how to dilute them, having the right supplies in the right place so you can dilute them properly. Uh, these things seem really straightforward, but it's all part of the standard operating procedure and the introduction to those materials uh, is made uh, much, much easier by having them, and having them handy, having them not in the uh, chief operating officer's desk or sitting up there far away from where the action takes place, but having them near the place where the task uh, is uh, executed. Um, SOPs facilitate leadership development. Uh, this is perhaps an odd place to put this, but if you allow your staff to participate in the development of these documents, you give them sort of incremental ability to show you what they know and how they can synthesize and integrate. Uh, we do this in our student laboratory. We've got a new program where our students run a weekend surgical opportunities uh, laboratory, uh, primarily cats, but crucial to that laboratory is a surgical team leader. And this is a student who is qualified to do spays, who is prohibited from doing spays for the day. Uh, that student has to manage the people, uh, and it's 12 to 14 students uh, that she has to manage for that entire day. So she's qualified to do surgery, but she's not allowed to because she has to stay uh, not scrubbed in. She has to be available to do all of the troubleshooting that a team leader must do in a 60 to 80 um, cat spay uh, surgical event. So leadership development is perhaps uh, a little off the beaten path, uh, but SOPs and participation in their development can help people become leaders. F uh, facilitates continuous improvement. Adherence or deviation from your standard operating procedures can be a basis for performance evaluation rather than the alternative, which is a somewhat random uh, performance evaluation. And of course, it documents your processes. This is the flip side. Inconsistency, patient neglect, no process for quality, inefficiency, uh, mythic training or on-the-job training, uh, leadership vacuum, stagnation of, of uh, process, that is your processes remain static or in fact they decline. There's degradation or deviation from uh, process if it's not documented and uh, maintained. So things start to slide uh, if you don't have standard operating procedures. Random performance reviews very creative problem solving. I admit that sometimes creativity is a gift and it's a good thing, but sometimes creative problem solving is not good for the animals in your shelter. And I love the term tribal knowledge. Tribal knowledge is the unwritten, undocumented way that information is conveyed in, in many circles. But Within your shelter, it's the, the sense that we do it this way, but I can't point to a document that says we ought to do it this way. But everybody thinks we should, so it's a tribal knowledge basis. How to create them? Well, you can institute them from on high. You can just write them and hand them over, but that can produce implementation challenges for years, potentially. You have to involve your team, and there's actually some literature on the human side that documents this, particularly in surgery. Growing body of evidence that links teamwork in surgery to improved outcomes. High-functioning teams achieve significantly reduced rates of adverse events. So the team produces a better outcome, and a high-functioning team produces the best kind of outcome. That's a disappointment to surgeons, because surgeons are kind of the center of the universe in an OR in their own minds you know, life in their hands kind of thing. But in fact, it's the team that affects the outcome more than the surgical technique or the surgeon in many cases. This is last year's pumpkin. I was proud of that, but uh, uh, all team members must work with the draft versions of the standard operating procedure. So everybody uh, whose life is touched by that task, everybody who has to implement that task or has to supervise that task, has to be part of the development of the standard operating procedure. Or there won't be buy-in. They won't do it. They'll resist. They'll complain. Now, they might complain anyway, 
but if they're not part of the development, uh, you may have very difficult time uh, with adherence to the protocol. We start with a goal, and there are high-level goals, there are process goals, and there might be participant goals. In the case of a teaching protocol, uh, we have uh, goals for our students. And this is an example from a surgical opportunities program that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, and so the highest level goal is that for the animals. So that animals are provided high quality surgical and medical procedures uh, that can be delivered at high volume due to the commitment of a relatively large number of students. For the organization, this is the collaborating shelter uh, on the weekends. Uh, that helps fulfill their mission. And then again, a student uh, goal at the bottom. After you establish the goals, you need to sketch out the workflow. And workflow involves a lot of concepts. I've been to a lot of shelters, and I've, I've been surprised when I go into a shelter, particularly a relatively high volume shelter, and I'll ask to see where intake occurs. And a lot of times, I'm, I'm, the answer is, well, it can happen here, or it can happen over here, or it happens when ACO brings them in, kind of happens in the garage bay and there's no dedicated space and there's no sense of consistent workflow for something that's very important in a shelter. Intake processing is perhaps one of the most important steps uh, for life-saving in sheltering uh, because that's the time that they get those important vaccinations and they get at least a cursory assessment of their, their physical status on the way in. And if the location and the process isn't established, then it's probably not happening with any consistency uh, and that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, so the workflow, when you're developing a standard operating procedure, the workflow ought to incorporate and include all of those features, provides an overview of the goals and process, and it also introduces the team members that, that are executing uh, the protocol. Again, from our uh, surgical opportunities program, uh, this is an overview of workflow. And so there's a goal within the workflow, and that is that no surgeon is ever waiting for a cat. That is, there's always a cat ready to go as soon as the surgeon has finished the last cat. Animals are never unattended. Um, and then also that the anesthetic time uh, is minimized for these patients. So those are goals that are built into the workflow description. And you can see that there are some other uh, sort of travel-related cats progress from station to station, et cetera. This is uh, part of the orientation materials for this same surgical laboratory. And so the students during their orientation are introduced to these various team positions. Um, uh, the physical exam induction team, prep team, castration station, spay setup team, spay, recovery team, and then there's a debrief at the end of the surgical session. So at the beginning of the day, there's an orientation or a reorientation because in fact, all of these students have gone through the orientation online before they come out for the day, uh, but it's reviewed very briefly the morning of. All of the students introduce themselves, even though they, they typically know each other reasonably well, uh, but they're reoriented uh, and their roles are clarified or identified, and then they go through the rest of the workflow description. And then we get down to the task level descriptions, and tasks include location. Again, for intake processing, that's an important part. Um, if you're asking somebody to uh, prepare dilutions of cleaning product, uh, that happens in a particular location with particular kinds of equipment as well. And I'm adding to this uh, or introducing the idea of checklists. Uh, we'll, we'll expand on that in just a little bit. Again, this is uh, an example of the uh, task list for uh, exam and induction stations. So physical exam, Etc. All of these things have to happen, and they happen in sequence, and they happen in a particular location. This is the surgical facility that was developed um, uh, to host our students. This particular organization, Philadelphia Animal Welfare Society, uh, used to hold the animal control contract. Uh, they were uh, relieved of the contract responsibilities, and they uh, repurposed themselves, became a rescue partner to animal control developed a surgical and wellness facility. They built it two miles from the veterinary school so that our students would have convenient access to it. Uh, and they developed it as a very flexible multi-bay surgery with beautiful tall windows. We have lots of natural daylight. Uh, unfortunately, the windows overlook the post office's parking lot. 
and the post office parking lot patrons are among the worst parkers in the world. So uh, my car was hit about two weeks ago. Despite being parked on a small berm, uh, I thought you know, 60 feet away from the nearest car would be pretty safe, but somebody backed into me about two weeks ago. Um, I usually get to see somebody get backed into at least twice a day uh, from those windows. Uh, this is an example of a cleaning, uh, exam room cleaning protocol from my practice. My office manager and staff have developed about 50 or 60 uh, standard operating procedures or protocols for various uh, tasks within my practice. Um, I wish I could develop 50 or 60 uh, protocols uh, in my lifetime, but my, uh, my office manager is very good at this. And this is a detailed description of all the steps. I don't expect you to be able to read it, uh, but this is our current exam room cleaning protocol along with the concentrations and also the renewal or refresh dates for the product. Many of these products have a finite shelf life or life in the bottle. This is a peroxide-based, uh, uh, accelerated hydrogen peroxide-based product, and uh, it has to be refreshed every week uh, in your exam room. So this goes through that in some detail. Uh, finally, or I'm sorry, uh, after tasks in detail, the various roles of the team members. Um, so on-site surgical coordinator or team leader in the case of the surgical program. Uh, there is a castration captain. The title for that, that role was uh, a variety of uh, titles, but they settled on castration captain. Castration captain actually has a sash that says castration captain serious about that. They have a sash that they wear, uh, and that's to identify them in a hurry. Uh, and that was inspired by Julie's program, Catnip, the, the surgical coordinator on site for Catnip wears an orange safety vest uh, because in a room full of 100 plus volunteers or 80 plus volunteers with a lot of chaos, it's nice to be able to find that person now when you need them now. So uh, the, the team captain or surgical coordinator um, and the castration captain are color-coded, so they're easy to find in the OR. It's not quite as big an operation as catnip, mind you, uh, and it's a smaller space, but still, when you're in a hurry, you want to be able to find these people. Uh, we have SPAE certified students. Uh, volunteer positions uh, for the day are SPAE participants and castration certified participants as well. Um, the team leader identification. Uh, documentation. SOPs have to be documented or they aren't real. They have to be documented, and the documents have to be in a place that is accessible when people need to review them, but it also has to be kept by somebody who will maintain them so that not everybody in the organization can modify them. Uh, you don't want people altering them willy-nilly. Uh, they will need to be revised, but there should be a process, and there should be a person or maybe a couple of people charged with revising them. This is an example of um, uh, a poster that's by one of the workstations. So this goes through in brief uh, the various steps for the feral cat prep station, um, including a depiction of a tipped ear, uh, the positive uh, results of the snap kits, and all of this is printed on a nice poster uh, that's right at the workstation. Review standard operating procedures for uh, the process content, that is the steps, make sure the steps are still uh, the ones that you're doing. And if there's a problem, if people are complaining or people have suggestions for revising the process, uh, it can be revised. You can change it. You don't have to keep the process exactly the same just because it started that way. Uh, accuracy, clarity, simplicity. Uh, sometimes there are ways to simplify the process and make it uh, easier for people. And also, if the process is necessary. That's, that's a fundamental question. Do we really have to do this, or does it have to happen here? That is, maybe it doesn't have to happen at this particular time. Maybe it can happen at some other point in time. And that's something that your staff can negotiate with you. Uh, they may have a suggestion for where a task would be better done at some other place. And if it makes sense or if it's equivalent in the medical care, from the medical care standpoints, uh, that's something that can happen. For example, in this particular laboratory, uh, they were doing vaccinations uh, at the prep station, and the prep station has a challenge keeping up with the surgical uh, paperwork. Uh, and so they suggested that the vaccines move to recovery where they've got a little bit more time. 
Uh, there's a little bit more time on the recovery station, a little less paperwork excitement. Uh, and so they moved vaccinations to the recovery side for this laboratory, and that was negotiated. Uh, your team leader, uh, your chief operating officer, your veterinarian should observe for choke points in whatever that task is. In the case of a surgical clinic, uh, what are the choke points? What are the points where everything jams up and you have people standing around waiting for surgery? Uh, in a high volume cat clinic, uh, retrovirus screening is a big choke point. And particularly when people ask for a retrovirus test, but they don't give you the what if it's positive options, <laughs> which seems to me you're either going to get a positive or a negative. It's predictable. It's going to be positive or negative. And if it's positive, that seems to be something the trapper or the owner or the shelter ought to have given some thought to and given you some you know, direction on the front end of ordering the test. And it happens all the time that you suddenly get this result and it's a complete surprise. It's a positive. And it just shuts everything down while you're trying to chase down a human being to get some direction. That's predictable. That choke point is predictable. Uh, a positive test result is inevitable at some point in your day if you're doing a high volume clinic and you should have some direction when they're signing the cat in uh, as to what to do with that result. So that choke point is predictable and somewhat solvable and yet if you don't attend to that on the front end of admissions, uh, you can end up shutting down your surgery or at least jamming up your surgery for 20 or 30 minutes uh, and you may not even resolve it. You may have the, you know, called the cell phone, rolled over to voicemail, you know, person's out of cell re contact and they can't get back to you in time, and then you don't know what to do with the cat. I'm not sure if this made it into your handout, but this is a little bit of a twist. Anesthetic protocol alert. How many of you want a safer anesthetic protocol or are interested in that? Okay. Hoping I have somebody's attention in here. In this particular example, perioperative death rate was 1.5%. Complication rate, uh, complications defined as these, post-op infection, pneumonia, unplanned return to the OR, unplanned return to the OR, or death, 11%. New protocol was introduced, dropping the cumulative death rate to 0.8%. Uh, 46% reduction. Complication rate uh, dropped to 7% or a 36% reduction. Is it a new injectable drug cocktail? Fancy new machine that goes ping? A more secure way of ligating the ovarian pedicle in a fat dog spay? I was very excited to see uh, the uh, lecture content for North American Veterinary Conference has Mark uh, Bollinger from uh, Tennessee doing a big fat dog spay lecture. So that's worth a look. No, this new protocol is perhaps the least sexy thing I can show on a PowerPoint slide. Checklists. That's right, checklists. Introduction of a checklist system in six uh, globally distributed human surgical practices decreased perioperative death rate 46% decreased complication rates, 36%. Checklists. Uh, Atul Gwande is an author, surgeon, uh, has written a number of books, uh, Complications, uh, The Checklist Manifesto. Um, after this, he was assigned to the World Health Organization's global uh, study of uh, implementation of checklists. So most human hospitals right now are beginning to or are well on their way to implementing a checklist system for surgical uh, practice. And these are the checklists that are recommended by World Health Organization as kind of a template or a blueprint. Uh, and they have various hard stops built into them. That is, the patient cannot proceed until the checklist is addressed. And it's a, it's a physical checklist. People in the OR have to complete it and have to audibly uh, acknowledge that they have completed the checklist or the patient does not move. Patient doesn't move out of pre-op. Patient doesn't have an incision started. Patient doesn't leave the OR until these things are addressed. Now, this is the concept. This is something that's rolling out right now. Uh, I met with the folks down the street at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, the human hospital, uh, which has 40 ORs, uh, and uh, you know, they're fairly busy practice. Uh, and they're well into, well into this section 
uh, they don't have uh, the sign out phase completed yet. So they're, they're not fully integrated into this blueprint. And I'll tell you that our, our program, our surgical program, is not fully integrated into this. This is something to consider uh, with various tasks that lend themselves to a checklist system. Uh, this is uh, developed from the avionics industry, airline industry, where very complicated uh, processes like flying an airplane are incredibly safe. And they're incredibly safe because there's a standardized way of getting started. There's a standardized way of problem solving. Uh, and then there's a, mechan a mechanism for uh, learning from events that happen. So there's a debrief or uh, uh, post-failure analysis uh, that allows them to develop safer checklists uh, going forward. This is some of the data from that study. Again, these were globally distributed uh, uh, hospitals. Uh, each of the hospitals saw improvement, though not every hospital saw improvement in every category. That is, some hospitals experienced reductions in complications, uh, but did not experience improvements in perioperative death rate. But cumulatively and individually, each hospital saw improvement with the implementation of a checklist. There were no other substantial differences in their anesthetic protocols or their caseloads or the case demographics or signalment. Uh, so everything else was relatively similar, and this happened in a fairly short study period. So this happened within about a four-month period of time, uh, so it was fairly compressed in time. Substantial improvement in outcome with the implementation of a checklist system. This is an example of the checklist that our students follow when we're in animal control as we're getting our patients ready for and as we're getting our patients uh, processed through a surgical. Again, these are, these are places where we have a hard stop built in. So with dogs, uh, exam patient, confirm the presence of testicles. That seems pretty straightforward, but how many of you have sedated a dog with nothing in the scrotum? You know? That's unfortunate because that dog could have spared a you know, uh, fairly expensive dose of anesthetic agent potentially, and certainly the dog did not, did not need to have a four-hour nap uh, in order to have a microchip implanted if he didn't have a microchip already. Um, and again, this is a detailed checklist that our students follow uh, as we're moving through the OR. This is a list of all of the surgical tasks that have to take place uh, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day with a patient. Why is surgery in red? I'm sorry? Somebody says it's the main goal. I can't tell you the number of students who want, they want to get faster in surgery. They want to get more efficient. And they imagine that if they can only get faster, you know, they can do more surgeries per day. But I'll tell you that all of these other things around surgery eat up more time than most. Now, students are somewhat slow, somewhat. But uh, if you can get standardized processes around all of these other things, and if you can become more efficient at those other things, and if you can keep your surgeon busy all the time, uh, a surgeon who can do a 20-minute dog spay can do an awful lot of surgery if every 20 minutes they're starting another dog. But if there's 10 or 15 minutes between every patient, no matter how fast they are, they're not going to get through a lot of surgery. So I, I use this slide to emphasize that there's a lot of other stuff that's happening other than the surgical procedure. And all of that other stuff has process around it uh, and needs to be standardized. This is a form, this is actually quite a nice form that our uh, Philadelphia Animal Welfare Society uses as the work order and surgical report uh, for every one of their patients. When we're in their facility, uh, we work off of uh, this uh, sheet, and the sheet has all of the menu options that, that are available for that particular surgical center. So it has the vaccine list, it has the tests that are available, heartworm or retrovirus, uh, and we can walk through uh, the work pretty easily because it's in a physical or vis visual format uh, and we can just check off the boxes and fill in the blanks uh, as we work through the case. That's just a nice useful form um, uh, to follow the patient around the OR. By the way, my opening slide was a picture of Operation Catnip from January of 2010. Uh, January is pretty cold in Philadelphia, so I thought it's 24 degrees in Philadelphia. I'll come down and visit Julie and Cinda and see Operation Catnip for a, a Sunday. Uh, so we scheduled this and I came down. 24 degrees in Philadelphia, it was 22 degrees. 
in Gainesville. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and it was a slow day. They did about 175 cats on a slow day. Uh, Julie, normally it's uh, 200, 250 is kind of their, you know, we're feeling good about the day, 250 cats, and you're usually closing your last abdomen at quarter till one or two o'clock, they're closing their last abdomen, 250 cats, you know, roughly half female. So that's uh, organization, that's uh, some standardized uh, operating procedures. This is an example of an exam station um, list. Just a slide or two about surgical standards in veterinary medicine. This is a screenshot from the American Animal Hospital Association, organization uh, very near and dear to me. Um, accredited practices uh, adhere to uh, roughly 900 standards, and there are some specific standards for various parts of practice. There's a lot of standards around surgery, medical records, and so forth. This is just an example of some of the standards around surgical practice. When you're developing standard operating procedures, you have to keep in mind that there is an emerging sense of standard of care. Uh, there are spay and uh, high volume spay and neuter guidelines that have been published for a few years. Uh, so there are standards, there are resources that you can go to uh, to see if what you're doing is in uh, conf uh, conformity to those standards. Uh, it used to be that there were local or prevailing standards of care in veterinary medicine. So if you were far from the big city and you were in a somewhat rural area, it used to be considered you were held to a different standard of care by veterinary uh, boards, of, uh, uh, boards of veterinary medical examiners uh, because you didn't have access to or ability to have the latest and greatest knowledge or, or gadgets. I will tell you from talking to people who sit on boards, uh, veterinarians and representatives of the public, uh, that that sense of local standard is changing and it's now one standard because knowledge is now easily available. Conferences like this, uh, other veterinary uh, medical conferences can easily distribute information uh, about the latest and greatest ways to do things. Uh, the internet has made uh, access uh, veterinarians have access to information that used to take a much longer time to distribute. So the sense today at boards of veterinary medical examiners is that you should know this stuff and you should know about pain management and you should know about appropriate surgical protocols because it's easily available now. So there is this sense that there are emerging standards. Those standards are going up, not down. Uh, it is no longer uh, the shelter held to a different standard than a practice. Uh, you do need to keep that in mind as you're developing protocols because your protocols may come under some scrutiny, uh, either from a volunteer who doesn't like what you're doing, who may you know, take a photocopy or take a, a screenshot of your protocols and share that with other people. So as you're developing, uh, not that that's the only thing to consider when you're creating protocols, but just keep that in mind. Your protocols need to be sound medically. We're hoping also that people are paying attention to the uh, ASV's guidelines for shelters. Um, uh, pay attention to what your state boards, you know, those of you who are uh, in contact with people who've had experience with the state boards or uh, if you get a publication from your state board, uh, if you're a licensed veterinarian within your state, uh, they probably send out some information to you on a, on a quarterly basis or yearly basis. Talk a little about errors. Adverse events and bad outcomes, how good processes and situational awareness can improve quality. Medical misadventures happen, to happen because of the following reasons, and this is based on error analysis in uh, human literature. There are entire journals in human medicine devoted to quality and quality assurance. Um, it's a very strong area of active study. Uh, obviously, medical misadventures are a huge, costly, um, uh, tragic uh, condition or, or circumstance, and so there's a lot of effort on the human side to try to mitigate those and prevent those. Uh, we look at systems factors, breakdown in delivery function, productivity pressures. Who's under pressure for productivity at their shelter? Um, discontinuous care or handoffs, that is, Patient care starts in one section or one function and then transfers to another function. Uh, and that can be from station to station. That can be from 
um, uh, category to category or status to status, so it moves from adoption to some other part of the shelter, there's an opportunity for loss of information or misinformation at each one of those handoffs. So handoffs are a weak link. Uh, weakly standardized processes or policies or lack of processes and policies, poor communication systems, and then lack of patient data. You just didn't know that the patient had this or that. Uh, sometimes that's because an owner doesn't tell you. Sometimes it's because it wasn't asked. Sometimes it's because it was lost. You had it and then you lost it. It got separated from the patient. Um, those are all systems. Everything in blue is a systems or a process problem. That is, with better processes, with better systems, with better protocols, you can mitigate or avoid errors in that category. On the bottom in black are individual operator errors that can happen. Failed situational awareness, tunnel vision, you just didn't know it was happening. You were so focused on the abdomen, you didn't notice your patient stopped breathing. Uh, those kinds of errors. Following faulty rules of thumb, that is, if it comes in looking like this, I do this. Well, sometimes it comes in looking like that for a different reason than the treatment uh, you're used to using. So sometimes we, we uh, fall to rules of thumb and sometimes rules of thumb don't work for us. Biases, uh, you may be inclined to treat things a certain way uh, because it's worked for you, uh, but it may not work in every case. Mental states or affect, if you're in a terrible mood, if you're incredibly distracted, uh, if you're angry, uh, the quality of your work, the quality of your thinking is degraded. Uh, so that's an individual type of error that can occur. And then technical factors, surgical accidents, surgical uh, misadventures, uh, those things can happen, they do happen, uh, but they probably happen a lot less than these other categories when it comes to bad outcome contribution. Situational awareness, how many of you have heard of this term? Situational awareness. Situational awareness is the ability to know in a complex environment uh, to be able to have a high-level view of what's happening overall. It's what fighter pilots are tested for to fly very complicated equipment with a lot of distracting um, uh, data streams coming at them. They've got a lot of information coming at them. They're in a very expensive, technologically advanced aircraft. They're 23 years old. They're flying a $35 million airplane. Uh, they screen and test for very high levels of situational awareness so they can keep track of all the stuff that's happening outside the plane and inside the cockpit. Uh, and there are various levels that have been described. Again, this is a, a field of research um, uh, for a variety of reasons, but with respect to surgery, uh, it's because situational awareness um, can uh, prevent or can lead to errors. That is, fit, lack of situational awareness. Pit crew lessons. How many of you are motorsports fans in the room? Any motorsports fans? Okay. So Formula One pit crew, we're in the south, so that's a NASCAR pit crew. Now from this picture, there's a lot of people. They do a pit stop in something under five seconds typically, four tires, fuel. Uh, they can do some other things, make some adjustments in under five seconds in many cases. It takes a lot of people to do it. Uh, the most important person in this is a fellow called the lollipop man. And he's the fellow here. He's got a pole, and on the pole is a go or a stop. He flips it around, and the only thing the driver does is watch that stop sign. And when the stop sign is flipped around, he knows he can gun it and he can pull out. It's the only thing the driver has to do when he's in the pit stop. Uh, and the lollipop man controls. He's the team leader for that entire event. Doesn't seem like a really hard job, does it? You know, Hold the stick and flip it at the right time. But he has to have a very high level of situational awareness. And he has to know exactly every task that every team member can do. Because he has the life of the driver, the life of the crew, the life of the driver and crew in front of them in his hands. He has to have the highest level of situational awareness when they're in the pits. And in motor sports, races are won and lost in the pits. Cars are going so fast, first and second place are separated by fractions of a second in many cases, and those fractions of a second are earned or lost during pit stops. I didn't invent this analogy. This is from the human literature. This is a, 
uh, they've looked at uh, pit crews, and they've had pit crews come into um, operating rooms. They've had them come into uh, surgical theaters. And they've had them take a look at process and to re-engineer some of their processes. NASCAR visited uh, a human orthopedic surgeon uh, who was troubled by his inability to do more than about four or five total hip replacements in his surgery. And so they, they looked at his surgical practices from start to finish. Now, they weren't there to recommend you know, technique. Uh, they were there to look at the process. And they reoriented his process and made him have a consistent team. And they implemented uh, more structure. Uh, team was sharply defined in divided roles. Uh, they tightened up his processes, not his techniques. They tightened up his processes. Uh, they became more organized with orientation, pre-event briefing. Uh, they had the equivalent of a lollipop man. They had a team leader. Um, they did, after the, the day of surgery, they did a debrief. They went through what went well and what didn't go well, and they learned from it. So they did data analysis. And they trained and cross-trained all of the members of the team so they understood each other's roles and responsibilities so they were a more effective, high-functioning team. Uh, and when they did that, they were able to take him from five total hips a day to about 12 per day. Uh, and if you're under productivity pressure, that's pretty good. Um, and so that was a good outcome. And that was from NASCAR um, and from a, from a pit crew looking at process. Standard operating procedures fundamentally improve your team's ability to organize, train, to function, and to lead. Checklists, more than any new drug, I'm sorry for the anesthesia people in the room, more than any new surgical trick, sorry for the surgeons in the room, will decrease your perioperative death and complication rate. SOPs will clarify and reinforce goals. This is uh, from one of our first years in the shelter. This is uh, one of my shelter medicine elective groups. Uh, this kitten, little uh, black kitten covered in roofing tar, uh, was brought in by uh, a roofer. Uh, they had been doing a roof in the summer, and this kitten had somehow gotten up onto the roof and drifted or wandered through the tar and came into animal control, and it happened that we were in the building uh, because the shelter would not have had four staffers uh, to sit around with warmed uh, Mazzola oil and uh, spend three hours uh, taking roofing tar off of this kitten. Um, this student then took the kitten home and of course found an adoptive home for it. So that was a good outcome for the cat and I think a good outcome for our students as well. SOPs will improve your productivity Therefore, your efficiency. Adherence or deviation will help with staff accountability and performance reviews. So you'll have a standard by which employee performance can be graded. Are they doing it the way they're supposed to? Have they been trained to it? And are they doing it the way they're supposed to? Yes or no. It's, it's much easier to tell if there's a standard uh, against which they can be judged. Checklist. Uh, if you implement them, it will reduce adverse events. Absolutely, it will reduce adverse events. And so in short, standard operating procedures and checklists save kittens. <laughs>